I guess, everyone. Well, uh, welcome to everyone uh, again. Like I said before, we have a great uh, panel here. We want to really dive into this because we know we've got a lot of hard questions for our new council uh, members here, and um, and it won't be too hard today. We'll we'll try to take it lightly, but um, but we, we welcome you. We we thank you for for your time and, and your and your service. Uh, we want to start by just having you take three minutes. Uh, three minutes to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll dive into some questions. We'll start with Ms. Lee. Good morning and thank you so much for coming. My name is Shakise Newton and you already know that I am newly elected to Richmond County Council. I am 56 days in, not that I'm counting, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so many of you here know me. I was born and raised in this community and I'm a business owner here. I run a consulting practice and I am just really excited about the opportunity to serve in a different way. And for those of you who do know me and have known me for a long time, um, some of you were shocked when I decided to run for office because it wasn't an aspir a long-held aspiration of mine. But like many of you, I looked across the community and I saw that there was an opportunity to do something different. I thought that I could add a new voice and a fresh perspective that I thought would help make our community stronger. And that's why I ran for office. And so we will, you will ask me questions, but I will also make an ask of you. And that ask is for you to be as engaged as possible in the process. Richland County has probably one of the biggest impacts on your daily lives of, of anything else um, that you interact with. We affect your schools and your policing and your bridges and your roads. Um, and to have concerned citizens like you who are involved makes absolutely all the difference. So I am here as a public servant representing your interests, but we need your voices to always be heard so that we can serve you better. So thank you for coming. Mr. Walker. Thank you for having me. Um, Joe Walker and everything she said. <laughs> Likewise, born and raised here in, in Columbia, um, owned multiple businesses across Richland County, saw a need, um, had a desire to continue my service, uh, served in the military for four years, and saw the opportunity uh, with this particular district at this particular time to jump on board and do something in a way that could impact those I care for, those I love. In, the, in my day-to-day -day life and the opportunity to conduct business here. So excited to serve once again. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Allison Terracio. Sorry it took me a little while to get here. Today is my son's 10th birthday. And so we were delivering uh, Dunkin' Donuts to Rosewood Elementary. Um, so I, my background is that I am a Kentucky girl who fell in love with a, a boy who lived in Chandon, who grew up in Chandon. Um, we lived in New York and we lived in Kentucky for some time where my son was born. Um, my husband is now the director of the Coger Center and so we were uh, moving back to Columbia, to South Carolina in the fall of 2016 and um, really found ourselves in a, a place where we were kind of in a, in a, a new opportunity and also a space where we, we saw a lot of opportunity to improve the world around us and to get involved in um, a deeper way. And so in the summer of 2017, uh, when, we, when there was a, um, a stepping away of commitment to environmental policies, I saw uh, local government step up and do things that were um, in alignment with my values of protecting the environment. And so I thought, um, I saw this seat come open and had a, a nice conversation with Seth Rose and uh, decided to run for this seat. So I'm really excited to work with my new colleagues. Um, I think you'll see that we are committed to, um, to working together. Uh, I know that we won't all choose the same votes all the, all the time, but we are um, establishing a really professional and uh, genial relationship with each other. And I hope that comes across um, when you see us up on County Council. All right, thank you for those introductions. And we'll dive right into the questions. Um, as new council members, what do you see as some of the major uh, issues that, that are on the table right now and, and in the near future for, for Richmond County? Um, 
One of the biggest opportunities that we have as a new council is to hire um, amazing talent to lead our county. And so um, I'm really excited to be looking at, um, at the new administrator position. Um, I think we have some fantastic candidates and um, I'm looking forward to having really good leadership that will just um, hire amazing talent. We, um, we have an opportunity to staff up a little bit. Uh, we have an opportunity to um, increase our pay and to make Richland County an employer of choice in, uh, in the Midlands and in South Carolina. So I'm really looking forward to that. I would also suggest that the hire of the new administrator is the most pressing and impactful opportunity we have as a council um, for various reasons. Uh, the workplace environment at the county and the administration is rather toxic right now. Uh, I, I would suggest that's from a lack of sustained leadership, whether it's frankly at the council level or at the administrator level, but continuity goes a long way. I know that from running a business. Many of you know that from running businesses. And right now we have a we have an environment that very few, if any, want to work in. And the opportunity to change that culture for me is paramount because everything that we ask, pro programming, uh, policy, et cetera, means nothing if you don't have the soldiers on the ground to execute on the mission. So to me as well, to hire the, the new administrator is imperative. So Allison mentioned the, the geniality. We won't always agree, but we do agree on this. And so first two things, I see them pulling in chairs from the back. I'll just point out that there are chairs up front and no matter what you've heard about Richmond County Council, there's nobody that, that is going to invite you to come up here so you're very <laughs> to, to have one of these seats. And so let me echo the hiring of a new administrator as one of the key priorities because I couldn't agree more. Richland County is a billion dollar organization and we need the continuity, we need to have a CEO. I think that organizations, and Andrea alluded to this, organizations take on the characteristics of their leaders. And so we not only need to have strong leadership, but we want that person there who's going to, quite frankly, I mean, at Richland County, let me be very clear, we have fantastic staff. We have absolutely excellent people who are working to serve here at Richland County. That said, again, we want to make sure that we have the right leader in place because that person is going to allow us to execute the priorities that we have. And so having that right administrator in place is hugely important. And the lack of leadership and the way that our previous administrator was handled, quite frankly, had long lasting damage and consequences for the county. So that is a huge priority. And if I can pivot for just a moment, so that's a, a county-wide priority. And then when I look at District 11 and quite <coughs> frankly across Richmond County as a whole, one of the, the main things that we do it, those are those three important words, quality of life. And so when I look to my constituents, quality of life issues are some of the really important issues where people, they care about their roads, they care about their parks, they care about their schools, they care about their communities. And so having that right leader in place is going to allow us to deliver those day-to-day -day quality of life pocketbook issues that we all care about. And I think everyone mentioned the county administrator. Why would I come to Richland County. What, so when you're talking to, when you're doing a search and, and you're looking at candidates from all over the country and the first thing they'll do is Google Richland County, why come to Richland County? How, how do you how do you get over that obstacle with with the issues that you have uh, with the administrator? Or the council administrator? Or the I'll, I'll three minutes, actually. <coughs> I'm trying to figure out who's going. Um, <laughs> that, that combined with an answer. <laughs> um, I've got one. I got one. So, so what you alluded to uh, earlier is that you, the Richland County Administrator role should be and could be a real progressive step, if not a, 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 an ultimate step in any municipal administration career path. Um, it's a $1.2 billion annual enterprise. There are CEOs across this country that strive for an entire career and never achieve even a nominal percentage of that from the scope or capacity of what they get opportunity to run. Now, 
Richland County has set a precedent to a degree. I shouldn't use that word. Precedent means that it would be a go forward symbol as well. So historically, and most recently, we have fumbled as far as how we've treated that administrator and what this position has become. So why would you come to Richland County as an administrator? One, it is a potentially lucrative opportunity from a career perspective. But two, to be a part of a change, to be a part of a pivot, as represented by the three of us and others on council who desire to change the way that things have been done in Richland County. And to be here at this time as part of that effort could and should be really exciting to the right person and with the right personality and mindset. So my answer would be opportunity. First, I'd like to acknowledge that one of our colleagues has joined us. So Delia Myers is with us. So if I falter, I'm just going to point to Delia in the back and she's going to answer any questions for me. So I promise you that there are many areas where I disagree with Joe Walker. I don't know what they are yet, but I'm sure there are some. But in terms of what you just said about the administrator, I couldn't agree more. Again, so yes, we are a billion dollar enterprise. But I think that sometimes in this area, there's such a love song for Greenville and Charleston. And they're wonderful. They're wonderful places. We are the capital county. We have amazing assets. We have great, talented people who live here. We have wonderful natural resources. We are fiscally strong. There are a lot of places where you could go where you wouldn't have access to the types of assets that we have here in Richland County. So this is an amazing opportunity. Now, that said, I do think that we need an administrator with some, shall we say, intestinal fortitude, right? We need somebody who embraces a challenge and says, this is a great organization at a great time, and I can do great things. And I think that I, for one, as a new county council member, am amazingly dedicated and devoted to doing everything I can to support our next administrator to make that person successful. And I think that when we're meeting that person, I'm going to do everything that I can to convey that because it is a hugely important position. Our support, our collegiality, our commitment to a shared vision is important. But please recognize that we live in an amazing place with amazing resources. And so this is not a charity case to work for Richland County. Like they said, it is a wonderful job opportunity. Are there challenges? Why, yes, there are. But there's also tremendous upside. And if I can just say one more thing, you know, when people ask me, what's it like to be on Richland County Council, I can honestly tell you it is all upside. I mean, the direction that we're going to go is up. I 100 percent believe that. I knocked on a lot of doors when I was running for this seat. And many people would answer the door and they would look at me and they would say, you're running for Richland County Council. Why would you want to do that? And so I think that I am a kind of I'm the kind of person who is driven to help and to step in and to step up in a lot of ways when maybe it wouldn't make a lot of personal or financial sense. It's not advancing necessarily my personal interest, but I feel called to help. And so I hold the belief that that person in our packet of candidates is there. That there's a person who sees a need and really wants to step up and step in. And yes, it is a fantastic job opportunity. And I know that person is out there who really has a heart for this work. And we're going to find that person and hire them. Now, should that and this is the last question in that in this area. But should that person sometimes look at traditional? It needs to be a county administrator from wherever with this much experience. What about a business leader? Is that out the realm of possibilities for administrators? We're talking about one point two billion dollar organization. Is someone outside of the traditional county administrator vein the appropriate? Or a couple of these. I don't mean to be one of these on every town, but I have a few. I'll take them. The 
So as a business leader, one thing that I would tell you is government operations and administration, for better or worse, do not function exactly like a traditional business model. Um, it, it is important that someone understand how to get things done and advance policies and, and, and take guidance and turn it into actionable, uh, executable orders. Um, and that does come through experience in government administration. Now, understanding business and applying a business mindset to financial direction, I do believe is critical. Does that mean it, it's you know an ex-CEO that's gonna come run Richland County? Possibly, uh, I would not necessarily expect that. Um, but applying business acumen to government operations is, is extremely beneficial. Um, so to answer the question, do I think it's going to be a business person? No, I think it will be somebody that comes from a government administration background just because it is such a different operation than a business operation. But I do hope that, and we are looking for someone who can apply a business mindset to government operations. Anybody else? You're good. All right, we'll move on. Taxes, taxes, taxes. I know every time you... You know, the streets you hear about taxes. Where, um, you know, in order to compete, and I'm going to tie this into economic development as well. So, in order to compete with um, other municipalities, counties, so on and so forth across the country uh, in this global environment, um, how do we begin to um, be competitive as it relates to taxes in this county, but still provide services that are needed uh, to the constituency? But, but how do you be competitive? Because I think as business owners, um, we feel most of the brunt of that, uh, that that becomes an issue. So any thoughts on where taxes can go and how do you stabilize that process as well? I can't believe I'm the one who's speaking up first. <laughs> um, I just saw Jeff Rubel walk in. Um, and so I'm really excited about economic development opportunities here in Richland County. Um, we have been just a little bit behind in getting our office up and going mm -hmm. um, but right now we're looking at some um, some opportunity to really do some some economic development and um, kind of broaden our tax base I guess and so you know to kind of go back a little bit to the last question you know government um, doesn't operate like a business because businesses exist to um, to turn a profit and to uh, benefit their stakeholders um, government exists to deliver uh, services to constituents, so to take in the right amount of money um, and then spend it on the things that uh, that constituents need. And so in order to do that, we have to be able to um, take in the right amount of taxes from, uh, from businesses and then, um, and then hopefully that will serve as some relief to individual taxpayers. Um, so the, the, I guess the short answer is we have some really good opportunities coming up, um, and hopefully we can we can right size the way that we are um, bringing in money and spending money. Yeah. Ms. Newt. So I think that yes, supporting economic development is is a priority. One thing though, when it, when it comes to taxes, is when it comes to many things with Richmond County and and life is I think that we have to accept reality and face facts. And so when you look at Richland County, um, and again, when you compare us with other areas, it's absolutely true that we do have higher taxes. And you better believe I've heard about it over and over and over again. Um, but I think that one of the things that's also important kind of on the other side of that ledger is making sure that we are certainly good stewards with the dollars that we are taking in. And that's something that's extremely important to me. I mean, when you look at something like Act 388, well, we don't control that, right? So that has a disproportionate effect on our tax base that quite frankly, we don't have in another area. When you look here, I've heard these numbers, you know, bandied around. So um, when you look at the large number of properties here in our area that are not on the tax rolls, that has a huge impact on what we're able to do. And so we have to face realities. We are a fantastic community. We offer great things. There, there are some things that we have to look at. And so how can we make sure that we're good stewards with the dollars that we are taking in? How can we make sure that 
when we're looking at what we want to do for Richland County, that there's not a presumption that we're always going to raise taxes, that there's a presumption that we're always going to evaluate, analyze, be good stewards of what we have, and we're not going to presume that more taxes are the answer. But then also, when we're looking at things that we're offering to, to organizations here, we always have to be mindful of the overall economic reality that we're in. Um, and we, just, we have some, some unfortunate realities when it comes to tax policy, and that's what we have to work with it. I pay $17.25 a foot in tax liability on a Marcos pizza on Two Notch Road. I pay $16.20 a foot in tax liability on a Marcos on Rosewood Drive. My lease rate on that same Marcos is less than the tax pass through. So to say Act 388 is near and dear to my heart, I know, I, I know this problem well. Um, we don't control the legislative decisions. We just have to deal with the fallout ramifications. Um, as such, as we seek out opportunities to help mitigate those expenses to our business owners here in Richland County, the biggest thing we can do is understand that, that, that a rising tide really does raise all boats. So expanding our tax base through the pursuance of and creating opportunities to bring large manufacturing companies <coughs> to this county for both employment and tax revenue generation. Um, pursuing aggressively economic development opportunities is going to help offset the revenue burden, the tax burden that we've placed on the Small Business Center in this county as a result of Act 388. So as a, as a newly appointed member to the Economic Development Committee, I'm excited to dig in and understand exactly where we can do that. Now, unfortunately to me, as I look at the, the, the one-off opportunities to bring um, to bring in tax uh, generating businesses, it, it feels like we're, we're, we're putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, uh, and, and we are to a degree. Uh, a lot of these projects are one-off, and we're having to do that because of, because of what Act 388 does to us. Um, but we're out there aggressively pursuing, and we've got a great team who puts forth great ideas, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. So bringing and recruiting those type of tax generating opportunities are what we're out there trying to do. Okay, we, we uh, started the same thing of economic development. <clears throat> I guess in recent times we've heard that uh, the Renaissance um, plan is sort of being revitalized. What does that look like now? Um, and what does, what does Renaissance, uh, and how, how does that help with, uh, you know, economic development? Because I'm <clears throat> making the assumption that it was meant to sort of revive some of the areas of Richmond County that are um, uh, black, that's been passed over for whatever reason, um, or it was bustling at one time and then growth went beyond it. Uh, what, what does that, what does Renaissance look like now? So just real quick, I'm not gonna answer the question, but before any gets, anything gets thrown from the audience, <laughs> I just wanna be very clear with what, was, what the directive given to our staff was Two Tuesdays, three Tuesdays, a meeting or two ago, as, as it pertains to the Richmond Renaissance. What council directed staff to do at zero dollars spent was come back to us, take, take Richmond Renaissance off the table where it's been sitting in limbo, which creates it creates turmoil for our staff because there are personnel and, and hours associated to a project that's sitting there. Nobody knows what to do with it. So what council did was provide guidance and said, take that plan, go dust it off apply real numbers as opposed to the hypothetical numbers that were applied previously, apply real numbers to it, specifically to the parks that we deem critical, critical needs of the county, and come back to us with a new plan that we can then put forth to the community and get complete stakeholder buy-in before we do anything else. So as a qualifier, that's the directive that was given to the council. Can I add on to that? So last night, um, and this is particularly for the person from the free time. So last night I was out in the community, it just did. And um, <laughs> I was Sorry. talking to a constituent and she goes, you know, I'm really concerned that, that this plan is gonna bankrupt the county. And I said, well ma'am, these are, these are the three parts, you know, it's facilities, it's <coughs> critical services for Southeast Richland, it's, it's alleviating blight and our staff is gonna come back with a plan. Which part do you think is gonna bankrupt our incredibly fiscally robust county? And 
And she said, well, all of it. And I said, well, but what we approved cost zero dollars. We spent no money. The money that has already been spent, that ship has already sailed and it's done. But our staff is coming back with a plan and you're going to have opportunities for input. And she goes, well, the media isn't covering it that way. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not actually in control of the media, but this is what was passed. And she goes, well, you need to call them and tell them that they need to write it that way. And I said, ma'am, it doesn't work that way. And she said, well, it works that way for me. I just call them and they print what I say. And I said, well, so <laughs> let, let the dictation begin. And we approved a plan. <laughs> and so our, our staff is coming back with that. So I guess I really just want to reiterate that. And so it, it bears the name Renaissance. And so whatever feelings you had about the Renaissance, you know, you may feel every time you hear it, but it is important that there, there are those three elements that I mentioned. There's a facilities plan, which is important, and that's the work of good government to deliver. It is critical services in Southeast Richland, and I represent, um, along with Ms. Myers, an area that, you know, where we have people who have real, real medical needs where they cannot get critical care. Um, without waiting and waiting you know, for medical services to arrive. This is um, not just important, this is not just good government, this is not just quality of life issue, it is, it is the issue of having, you know, having a life. And then when you look at remediating blight in our county and making sure that when people come to our area that we appear to be as vibrant and beautiful and bustling as, as we really are. So, so those are important aspects of the, the Renaissance Emporium. I will completely admit I forgot what your original That's question was. Because I so vigorously wanted to echo what Joe was saying. <laughs> um, I'll add in for just a little bit. Uh, the word toxic has already been used this morning, so I will bring it up again. Um, I would have said during my campaign that the um, the constituency for something called a renaissance was about zero um, in where I'm from, or and so, but that's the state of affairs. Regardless of what we call this program, um, is really that money has been spent, um, and that there are needs in the county that my colleagues have referenced already um, several times. And so we have got to have um, adequate office space. And when we talk about bringing in um, a top-notch administrator and we talk about staffing up to the level that we need to staff up to do the, uh, the work of the county, uh, we've got to have places for them to, to work. Um, when we uh, talk about our values of justice for all and we go and look at the courthouse and we see uh, where the, our public defenders are working, um, that doesn't reflect uh, my values of justice for all. So I feel like we have got to, we've got some work ahead of us, and certainly with, uh, with blight and services all around the county, not just uh, centralized in one space. Um, we, want, we, the, we want the work of the county to reflect our stated values. Um, and so if we hopefully have a, an opportunity to rebrand <coughs> this, um, this project, um, but the, there's work that's got to be done. Okay. Um, Can I add just one more thing? Please. So one thing that, that again, <coughs> I, I would ask of you as our citizens and voters is, is please ask questions about this. We want you to ask questions. I would love to answer any question that you have about the Richland Renaissance. And I think that one of the things that is going to get you, you know, the government that you deserve is when you raise up and ask those questions and when you, you know, not just demand answers but better service. And, and I think that it's extraordinarily important. So I want to answer every single solitary question that you have about Richard Renaissance and I'll hang out in the back to do that. So please know that I, I feel comfortable speaking for all three of us up here. So if I'm wrong, tell me later. Um, but I think that we, <coughs> Um, are all committed to an extraordinary level of transparency. And so whether it's Renaissance or something else, we, we absolutely want to have that dialogue with you. <coughs> Another, I guess, hot button issue, uh, continued sales tax. Um, uh, I think the, um, there's been a lot of news on the penny for program income. Where do you see the penny sales tax program? Because that is a, a big, that's a billion dollar project as well. Uh, where do you see the penny sales tax program and where is it going? The rich and <laughs> don't all rush to answer hey, right. that. I'm, I'm sure you, you know, don't fight over that. Uh, it's new. Where do I see the penny sales tax and where is it going? 
So in the spirit of when we make promises to our citizens, we need to deliver. So there is a referendum, as, as you all know, that passed where we make promises. And when I say we, you know, I'm 56 days in, but you know, we as, as a body, you know, make promises about what we were going to deliver. And so from a penny sales tax perspective, we have, we are delivering, right? So we are paving roads, we are fixing um, services, et cetera, we're delivering our promises. And I'm sorry, I, I am, after reading a hundred and however many pages of, of transportation of uh, purchase orders and change orders for the penny tax, my, my brain's a little befuddled, but believe me, there's a lot of work that is going on when it comes to the penny tax program. So we are delivering on what we promised. At the same time, realities change economically from when we pass the penny tax from when we're delivering the penny tax. And I think that what we're gonna have to do as a county is we're gonna have to come back to the citizens and we're gonna have to say, this is how much money we have. This is what we've done. This is how much money we have left. And this is what we can do with that money. And this is how we think we need to proceed. So there are parts of the penny tax program where you know the cost from 2012 and the cost from 2019 vary. There, there are parts where there's not enough money or there are things that are over budget, for example, where we're gonna have to come back to the people and we're gonna have to say, again, this is what we told you we were gonna deliver. This is where we are and this is where we're going. So we are absolutely committed to being good fiscal stewards of the dollars that we collect, whether it's penny tax revenue or any other revenue, we are absolutely committed to being transparent. And I think we're gonna have to, like I said, come to the citizens of Richmond County and say, this is this is where we are and this is how we suggest we move forward. Anybody? But yeah. real, real quick before we move on to the question, I just want to piggyback on, on what Ms. Newton just said. Absolutely correct. We have to just we have to take a reality check. Where are we? Snapshot in time. Let's take a look at the program today and where is it going to put us five years from now? Are we going to be able to fulfill the promises made in this referendum? That's a that's that's a factual, quantifiable answer. But as we work through that process, what I want everybody to be careful of is the decisions made and in, in, in the in the, the snapshot, et cetera is not necessarily a referendum on the, the PDT and, and, a, and a portion of the PDT is here. We, we as a council, much like other projects, have in historically, um, we, we have a way of slowing things down. And in this business, specifically construction related businesses, time equals money. So as we move forward and look at what the opportunity is to, to salvage as much of the program as we can on the back end and deliver as many of the projects as we're voted on, understand the PDT has done what they've been asked to do. Um, they've executed on their contract and we have a great working relationship with, with the PDT and its members. So I just wanted to, again, another qualifier, I feel like I'm full of qualifiers today. But, um, as we look at this program and the path forward, understand that the, the PDT is executed on what they've been asked to do and what we've allowed them to do from a timing perspective. Yeah, my, my follow-on question is related to that, Walker. Um, I, I understand that there's the project management committee that operates sort of over the penny tax and um, quasi outside to the county council and the county itself. And I've heard lots of things about how they get paid. I don't want to get into the weeds here. I'm just curious to know whether there is a transparent process that allows the public to see how these projects are being managed and how those fees for the management of those projects are being charged. That may be more than 50 days till get there. <laughs> the answer is is yes, and I, would, I probably have to ask David what the website is, but there, there is an updated website that the PDT manages that shows by project cost allocations, dollars allocated, dollars spent, remaining to be spent, et cetera. It's a very general or generic project budgeting cal really calendar, really. Is that to them? Yes, uh, I believe all dollars spent are shown by project now. Is that the level of granularity that you're necessarily looking for? Maybe or maybe not, but, but there is a mechanism in a website.
website where you can go and see what has been spent on that project. I look forward to hearing about it. Okay. It's richlandpenny.com? richlandpenny.com. Can I just add on to that? I think we have the penny, sorry, the Monday afternoon committee meeting is the penny, transportation penny committee, ad hoc committee, yes. And I believe that would be open to any member of the public. And I have never not walked away from one of those without a thick packet of, you know, what's been spent, what's come in, what are the projects, explanations of the projects and where they are. So I would encourage anybody to show up. Okay. City, and then we'll, after this question, we'll open it up for the audience as well. City, county, Lexington County relationships. Let you guys know. Where do you see that going? There's been a lot of starts and stops with that process. Where do you see, you know, the city with the county, the county with Richland, I mean, Lexington County, all three, you know, there's projects that we've worked on together. Where do you see that relationship going? Anybody? So that's one of the things I'm most excited about as part of a pivot or being representative of a new opportunity with fresh relationships. We are already seeing the benefit of that. There are multiple collaborative efforts underway with the city today. I hope that we'll be able to tout and make public some of the progress that's being made there. But I think that you'll see actions resulting from hard work since day one by many of us and other colleagues on the council to really reach out and bridge those somewhat broken, if not tattered, relationships across both the city and Lexington County lines. So that's really been an exciting process to watch. And I am personally very encouraged with the direction that we're heading with those relationships. Just to add on to that, you know, we have our chair, we have our vice chair here. And I know that Ms. Myers has, and Mr. Livingston have had some time to speak with the mayor and Tamika Isaac Devine, Councilwoman Devine. And I know that we are making progress toward working together. So really specifically, we're going at it as a person to person, not so much, you know, kind of, I'll have my people call your people, but really sitting down together and working together. One more thing, maybe put myself out on a limb here. One of the other things that, and I'm not going to speak for my colleagues here, but as the three new people to council, one of the habits that we are trying to, I'm not going to say break, that would be the wrong word, but create new opportunities for is the, because it's how we've always done it, habit. And this would be one of those. This would be an opportunity to say, hey, there may be a better way. Are you open to new information? Look at Ms. Newton, because that's how we talk to each other when maybe we disagree slightly. So the opportunity to change some of the, because we've always done it this way mentality is exciting for all of us. I believe for all of us. And if I may just state the obvious, you know, we're all humans, right? And so I think that part of it is a question of philosophy. And so from a philosophical perspective, we all sit in here and our colleagues certainly want to have and cultivate better relationships. And that's one of our priorities. And on a human to human level, we are reaching out, we are talking to our colleagues. So I think Ms. Horatio mentioned some of the efforts of Ms. Myers and Mr. Livingston, but it's about collegiality and cultivating that spirit. I mean, I think that, you know, we learned this stuff in kindergarten, right? It's not terribly complex sometimes the art of relationship building. It's just, it's a question of do we make it a priority and are we really working on it? And I think that we are. I think that we are. And I think that if you're not already seeing the fruits of that, that you will start to see the fruits of that because it's extraordinarily important. We'll open it now for council. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just two things. First of all, thank you all and Ms. Myers for y'all's willingness to serve. We really do appreciate that. Secondly, I just want to piggyback on something y'all just said from the standpoint of the hospitality industry. You know, you used the expression about not just doing something because it's been the way it's been done previously. And I'd like to respectfully suggest that y'all apply that to the way 
so I would afford the deriving return for those like me who pay into it. But, but, but do know that that is a priority, especially of this three you see here and others. I'm, I'm referencing us because we're the ones before you, but um, that, that is a very, when, when I use the moniker of not, not doing things just because that's how we've always done it, that H stacks uh, dialogue or, or conversation would be at the top of the list. Oh, yeah, thank you. For years, we've heard that um, the city of Columbia, two thirds of the properties are all the tax roll. Uh, I'm not sure about what the county is, but it means that we pay roughly three times property taxes we, that we should. We're paying for our property and somebody else's. I proposed for years, or actually decades, that we use uh, insurance ratings for um, fire and police to charge a fee instead of taxes to be a fee to nonprofits to help fund uh, our, our government because we're not getting anything from the nonprofits when we roll out a fire truck or a police car or anything. Would you guys be in support of that? And my second question is what is your plan for public transportation and bus system after the big tax program? So those are two disparate questions. So in, in terms of the first question, would I support the fee that you proposed? The answer to that is, I don't know. Um, I'm open to new information as um, my, my colleague, Mr. Walker, and I talk about. The fact is, like I said, I think that our tax policy in Richland County always has to begin with accepting reality. And that reality is, is part of what you said. There is an extraordinary, there, there is an extraordinary an extraordinary, I speak English, number of properties that are off the tax rolls, 380, et cetera. And so I think that we absolutely are in a position where we can look at creative ways about how do we address that. So can I speak to your specific way? No, I can't, I don't, I don't have enough information on that, but am I open to considering new ideas on that? Um, sure, absolutely. Um, when it comes to public transportation, public transportation is, is hugely important in our, in our community, and I don't know that you are necessarily the community that usually uses um, public transport, but but it is a, a vital part of what we do. And I had an opportunity to meet with John Ando over the comment last week, and he is uh, very focused on making financial plans for how the comet will move forward. So, you know, from, from my perspective, I'm extraordinarily supportive of public transportation. Um, you know, with the penny, beyond the penny, I think it's something that we have to find a way um, to figure out how we're gonna do as a community because it's vitally important. Do I have a, a silver bullet? I actually don't. Um, but it is um, definitely something that we're focused on. And, and let's be real about the penny. And one of the reasons, you know, it's always important to <coughs> deliver on, I don't know what that means. That was <laughs> <the time. laughs> I, I would tell you more, but the yeah. timer went off, so I'm not <laughs> The wrong signal. That's what I want. Uh, <laughs> okay, right, okay. And I'm sorry, we'll press for time now. Sure, so. sure. Yeah, 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 specific question. Yeah. yeah. So, so my, my answer is going to be more generic. But like Ms. Newton, I, first I've heard your proposed <laughs> strategy. Don't have enough information to opine on it. But I, I think more globally, um, fire, police utilities, et cetera. What, what we are doing is pursuing opportunities to be more efficient with the dollars that we have. Um, that could speak to all programs <coughs> included. Um, one of the things as we cross these relational, municipal relational lines, City of Columbia, Christian County, Lexington County, is identifying who, who does what best, who provides the best service at the lowest cost, incremental cost per user. And as we move down the path, whether it's fire, uh, policing, water, sewer, public transportation. One of my endeavors as, as, a, as a business minded person on this council is to seek out those who do it best at the lowest cost incrementally to you. And if we can become more specialized in our trade, we, we not only will not need potentially more money, but we could free up dollars that are currently being used inefficiently within these programs that could offset the expensive programs that need funding down the road. So that's one of the pursuances I have, is identifying the specialists within the given industry trade that can provide the best service to our constituents at the lowest incremental cost. 
I'll just say that, you know, I believe the tax question has been answered as to where we kind of find ourselves. But I will say that I'm committed to public transportation, to the Comet. I believe John Endo is visionary in what he's doing. So it's not just big buses. It is really creative ways to get people around in the most efficient way possible. And I believe that it will take some creativity, possibly, to ensure that the public transportation is funded in the way that it needs to be. But I believe every large metropolitan area is kind of dealing with that right now, too. And so we have opportunities to look towards best practices for other municipalities and counties of our size, you know, across the nation. So I hope we can also be inspired by others. I think we've got time for one more question. I'm Samaria Brown. I just wanted to ask a question from the administrative community perspective about the Renaissance Project. How would it be able to employ people from the community and people of low income and so on? Maybe young? Maybe children? Teenagers? I think I heard the question. The question was, you're from the Dentsville community, that's correct. How will the Renaissance Project affect individuals as it relates to employment from those communities, especially individuals of low income or low wealth? That's the question. I think my answer to that is not a direct answer to that as much as it is an explanation, again, of where we are with the Renaissance and what the Renaissance is intended to be. So the Renaissance really got itself in trouble last go around by becoming something other than it was originally intended to be, meaning everybody dogpiled on them with wants. If you're going to get X, then I want X, et cetera, et cetera, to the point where it got so inflated that it was not a viable project anymore. The Renaissance Program is to be presented to address critical needs, current critical needs of the county. Now, some of those needs are administrative office space to replace what we already have. When we look at job creation, to address the question of job creation, I can't remember the number. I'm not sure if any of my colleagues do. But the number of vacancies we currently have in our county administration is tremendous, but we're limited in filling those vacancies by physical office space. We don't have anywhere to put the people that we need to hire. So addressing those office space needs will, in fact, create a county-level employment opportunity. Specific to Dentsville, I'm not sure. But again, as we address that need across our county, it's going to help all of the constituents. But the Renaissance Program has a very specific intent. And what we as council members don't want to do is steer off of that intent, because as soon as we do, the project becomes inflated and not viable, and we want to address the critical needs of the county. So yes to what Joe said, and also, again, the critical heart of the Renaissance is how can we deliver on our fundamental responsibilities of good government, right? And so part of the philosophy is, so while it's true that if our offices move, for example, that would create opportunities for businesses that are around there, that's not necessarily the intent of it. But the intent is how can we deliver the services that we are obligated to provide in the most efficient, most customer service friendly way? How can we do that? How can we, if you look at blight, for example, how can we remediate blight so that our communities are attractive places where people want to be? And quite frankly, I don't have any firm data on this, but if I had to imagine where blight tends to be, I would say that there's probably more blight in areas that are more economically disadvantaged than other areas. And so once you create that pattern, you create a community that doesn't look as attractive as people want. So I do think that, generally speaking, if we're able to deliver on what we're supposed to do from a good government perspective and looking at blight, looking at creating those attractive communities, looking at making sure that we're delivering those services, that that helps us attract the kind of opportunity, the kind of businesses that we want that help address that, albeit indirectly, because as Mr. Walker said, that's not the specific purpose of the Renaissance Plan. But separate from the Renaissance, 
Um, you know, we have, as a county, um, a strong relationship with, say, Midlands Tech, uh, which creates opportunities for um, students to, to find, find their path toward meaningful work. And that ties back into our economic development opportunities. So we are looking, <laughs> we're looking at a time in Richland County um, of potentially really exciting growth. Um, and so um, I would say just kind of stay on the lookout for opportunities, um, you know, with, uh, with our school system, with yeah. our higher education system, uh, with folks thinking really creatively about how to engage um, our, our citizenry in terms of uh, building job skills and connecting them to meaningful work. So. <coughs> um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Try to do one thing and something else. Um, thank you uh, to our council members. Can we give them a hand? <laughs> you know you're only a couple months in, and for some of these questions, they're a tough question. Um, and, and, we, uh, and we know you're drinking to a fire hose to some degree, but I think you did a great job of handling that. Um, continue to do, uh, thank you again for your service. And uh, continue to do the work of this county. We appreciate you. At this time, I'm not sure. Okay, we have got this. Which one? Okay. Okay. Everybody's pointing like this. Yeah. Um, we've got Miss Henry Baskins who's going to come up and give us a few updates. Just, just briefly again. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing what else comes out from the new members of the council. Thanks to the co-chair in the in the back. Uh, thank you very much. We look forward to working with all of you. So thank you. Um, only you have what our upcoming events are with you. I just want to share with you, um, in May, we have our annual golf tournament. Uh, Ashley has shared with me that it's almost sold out already. So if you like golfing, please, right now is the time for you to call Ashley uh, and secure a team or a sponsorship for that event. Uh, in addition, we have started something uh, on with small businesses. They are, uh, we are proud of the large and medium-sized businesses we have uh, as chamber partners. We are extremely proud of the small businesses, the mom and pops that we have as well. You make up in this country and in this community 80 to 85 percent of the jobs are created by small businesses. So thank you. And in doing that, we're going to have a networking and growth strategy session with our Small Business Council, and that's listed on your agenda for May 22nd. <coughs> Ron Harvey is here, who chairs that committee. Uh, thank you, Ron. Also, I see Ann Thomason is here. We are starting what is gonna be called a Northeast Connection or Link, we'll tell you the name as soon as we settle on it. In Northeast Columbia, there are a lot of businesses in <laughs> Northeast Columbia who want to get connected with the chamber. Again, we used to do that in business in your own backyard type thing in the past, we're going back to that. We're going back so that small businesses <laughs> can take an hour out of their day, come together, learn, network, uh, and learn ways to improve their business and improve their bottom line. So you'll be hearing more about that, where we'll be meet meeting and when we'll be meeting, you'll be hearing more about that soon. Other than that, do you have anything else to say? Our next so, meeting. Our next meeting is is my arm uh, long Tuesday, enough. April 2nd. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we have an administrative update with uh, Representative Teske and Seth Rose. Thank you. So we look forward to it. Thank you very much. Have a great day. <laughs>